Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. It's my first video of 2021. Just taken a little break to refresh, recharge the batteries. Now it's time to get back into it and take a look at some news and rumors from the last little bit. A lot of this is going to be a bit of a lead up into CES, which begins as a virtual show next week, where we are expecting a range of hardware launches across various categories. I'm interested to see how the the virtual show goes and whether it makes sense to have a whole bunch of launches at the same time when there isn't an actual show floor for demos. But yeah, we're probably just looking at a single year of this anyway. The first topic I wanted to discuss with you today is the situation around PC hardware stock levels and availability. We've just suffered through a few months of absolutely terrible availability for basically all the new products that launched in the final months of 2020. So surely by the time it comes around to 2021, we should be seeing better stock, at least that's what should be happening in an ideal world. And sadly, we're not living in that world right now. So let's explore these launches chronologically. First up, we have NVIDIA's GeForce RTX 30 series, which officially launched on September 17, 2020, with the RTX 3080, followed by the RTX 3090 a week later, the 3070 in late October, and then the 3060 Ti in early December. This means it's been three and a half months since the RTX 3080 hit shelves, and just over two months since the RTX 3070 launched. Despite a considerable amount of time since launch, all of these products remain incredibly difficult to find in many regions, particularly in the United States. Right now, if you want an RTX 3080, your only hope is to buy one in a pre-built system, otherwise you'll need to wait for major retailers to restock and then hope you can jump online and order one the second they are posted. There is still a massive supply shortage of these cards that is lingering more than three months later, which is firmly in disaster territory as we've been describing this launch for a while now. In fact, one of our local retailers, PC Case Gear, has a page up where you can view current RTX 30 series stock information. While orders for some models are 100% filled, meaning you should be able to buy those models when the next shipment arrives, there are still multiple cards with outstanding orders from just after launch day. Those cards include the ASUS Tough Gaming models, the Gigabyte Eagle, and MSI's Gaming X Trio and Ventus cards, so a lot of the more budget-oriented models there. The RTX 3090 is in a somewhat better position, being a premium, highly priced product. It doesn't attract as much demand. Here in Australia, you can buy one right now if you wanted to, albeit at an inflated price. In the USA, you won't have as much luck. The cards are still hard to find over there. Then the RTX 3070 is, yeah, you guessed it, also very hard to find. Although our understanding is the card is being supplied in greater numbers than the RTX 3080, so at times it has been possible to buy one. While out of stock at most retailers right now, I did check a few days ago on PC Case Gear and there were a few RTX 3070s available. Again, in places like the USA, you've had to be on the pulse for when stock lands to get one despite being two months after launch. So while Nvidia did supposedly delay the 3070s launch to help increase Increase availability, it hasn't really done much for the future months. The 3060 Ti, similar position, although it's only been on the market for a month, so I guess it deserves a little bit more slack than some of those older GPUs. So in summary for NVIDIA GPUs, it looks like stock levels are starting to improve slowly, uh, but it still remains in a fairly terrible position for most buyers, particularly those in large markets. You may have had a chance of occasionally finding some RTX models in stock, but the RTX 3080 in particular is still quite difficult to obtain. We're hoping that will improve throughout this month and possibly a GPU like the 3070 will be more readily available, but it doesn't sound like RTX 3080s are going to be just sitting on store shelves waiting to be bought anytime soon. The next launch we had was AMD's Ryzen 5000 series and all four of those CPUs launching on November 5th. All things considered, this was probably the best launch we've had in recent months as it seemed like there was at least some supply of some Zen 3 CPUs in various regions. And depending on where you lived, a product like the Ryzen 5 5600X could have been available for up to a few hours after launch rather than selling out in seconds. The upper end models like the 5950X though were in pretty short supply. However, in the months that have followed, AMD has struggled to resupply the Ryzen 5000 series in any significant quantities. And once again, we have a situation where you have to slam F5 whenever your local retailer gets stock in hope of receiving one. At Newegg, for example, your only options right now for buying a Zen 3 CPU are paying stupidly inflated prices. Even bundle deals, which package up a CPU with other stuff like a motherboard, SSD, or power supply are fully out of stock right now. The lack of availability for these CPUs has had flow-on effects for older Ryzen products. 
The Ryzen 5 3600, for example, is currently selling for $10 above its $200 MSRP, which is insane for an 18-month-old product. The 3900X is $50 above MSRP, while several other products are only available through third-party sellers, also at inflated prices. Even a CPU as old as the Ryzen 5 1600 is selling for stupidly high prices. So this makes basically AMD's entire Ryzen lineup difficult to recommend for people building a PC right now. Your best option is really to go with something Intel, where a chip like the Core i5-10400F is much more attractive at a price tag of just $160. At least for AMD's Zen 2 and Zen 3 CPUs, these issues with stock and pricing are coming down to a massive crunch on 7 nanometer wafers from TSMC. Basically, AMD's entire lineup, Zen 2 CPUs, Zen 3 CPUs, Renoir APUs for mobile, Radeon 5000 and 6000 series GPUs, and the semi-custom SoCs used in next-gen consoles are all manufactured on TSMC's 7 nanometer node. That's a lot of products across multiple generations, all with sky-high demand, all requiring the one node. For Radeon RX 6000 series GPU availability, there's mostly bad news to share. The RX 6800 XT and RX 6800 launched on November 18, with the 6900 XT launching December 8th. So they've been on the market for about a month and a half now. It is currently extremely difficult to find these GPUs, far more so than NVIDIA's RTX 30 series, and for most products, supply is virtually non-existent. To compound that problem, premium models like Sapphire's Nitro Plus and PowerColor's Red Devil uh, remain ludicrously overpriced, so even if stock did appear, you'd have to fork out over $800 for an 6800 XT, which is at least a 23% markup. We've talked about all this stuff on the channel before, but of course it is disappointing that it is still an issue today. There are now more models listed for purchase, including more entry-level models like the ASUS TUF, ASRock Challenger, and Sapphire Pulse, but it's not like pricing is any better there. Despite AMD telling us they had enabled AIBs to hit the $580 and $650 MSRPs for these graphics cards, a basic design like the ASRock Challenger Pro RX 6800, for example, is listed for $660, so that's a 14% markup on that GPU's $580 MSRP. That's not as crazy as higher-end Nitro Plus designs from Sapphire, which sell for $730, but it's still a poor situation for prospective RDNA 2 GPU buyers, and ultimately, even if these cards were available, they would be incredibly difficult to recommend over NVIDIA's offerings, which, when in stock, are more reasonably priced. And it's certainly disappointing that those entry-level models are coming onto the market and are still receiving those high price tags. AMD deserves, I guess, slightly more slack than NVIDIA on availability given the 6000 series launched a month and a half ago versus three months for the RTX 30 series, but that slack has been eroded by the continuing saga of inflated pricing, which now appears to have infected what should be those cheaper models as well. We are yet to see any evidence that AMD has actually enabled AIBs to hit the MSRP like they told us late last year, so we'll have to continue monitoring that situation. The lack of GPU availability has had massive flow-on effects throughout the entire market. At least with CPUs, there are a couple of Intel CPUs worth buying for PC builders, but right now there really isn't a single graphics card worth recommending that is actually in stock and able to be bought. Steve and I were looking through the market yesterday, and one of the main issues is that not only are last generation GPUs much worse than new GPUs from a price to performance perspective using launch prices, most last gen GPUs are selling way above launch pricing. The cheapest RTX 2070 Super on Newegg that's in stock is priced at an insane $730, which is simply not worth buying when something like the RTX 3070 exists. Again, we're faced with most of these GPUs only being available through your third-party sellers who have no trouble sending those prices sky high when Newegg's first-party stock runs out. Even a GPU like the RX 580 is currently out of stock from Newegg directly for $240, and that's slightly more than the card's launch price from April 2017. That is how insane the GPU market is right now, and of course that's not even factoring in that if you actually wanted to buy an RX 580 that's in stock, you're looking at spending over $300. 
So really on the GPU side, the entire market is screwed right now and will take some time to recover. Like I said, it's not worth recommending you buy any GPU right now, even on the used market, which is also affected because pricing is insane and cards just aren't available. The lack of available new GPUs at the high end has caused insane inflation at the lower end and used market, and that's compounded by the cryptocurrency mining situation where prices for coins are sky high, which again is making GPU-based mining viable. Oh, and NVIDIA allegedly have been selling gaming GPUs direct to miners as well. So yeah, that's not great. Unfortunately, we were hoping to see better signs of an improving PC hardware market at the start of this year. And while we did expect it to take until you know late January or February for the gears to properly grind into action, it's not looking good as it stands right now. The best hope we have is NVIDIA getting their GPU supply situation resolved, and they seem most likely to execute, which will really hurt AMD, unless AMD can get both supply and price inflation under control. Next up, we're going to briefly run through some rumors relating to upcoming products, which hopefully will be launching with stock available, though I'm not too optimistic on that. And this will give you a bit of a preview of CES next week. And we are going to start here with NVIDIA. So NVIDIA have a press event scheduled for during CES next week, and it's expected that they will unveil RTX 30 series laptops at that event. Not 100% clear on what GPUs will be shown, but it seems to be a full stack situation. So at least an RTX 3080, 3070, and 3060 with the possibility for even lower tier products like a 3050. These parts have been leaking like crazy through various OEMs like Asus and Lenovo recently. So based on various reports, it seems that NVIDIA will once again be muddying the waters with mobile GPU naming, but to an even greater extent than previous generations. With the GeForce 20 series, mobile variants typically had the same CUDA core count configuration as their desktop counterparts. So an RTX 2070, for example, would have 2,304 CUDA cores, regardless of whether it was mobile or desktop. NVIDIA would then downclock the mobile part significantly to fit within the lower power envelope that is possible in a laptop form factor, leading to lower performance in most instances. With the 30 series, it appears that NVIDIA won't be using the same core configuration for similarly named parts. Rumors currently suggest the RTX 3080 Mobile has 6,144 CUDA cores, down from 8,704 with the RTX 3080 desktop with lower clock speeds as well. This is likely because it's simply not possible to put a 320 watt GPU into a laptop, which at best typically do up to 120 to 150 watts. The higher power targets for the RTX 30 series on desktop will be to blame there, as the RTX 2080, for example, was just a 215 watt GPU, which makes it more suitable for bringing across to laptops without cutting CUDA cores. Going from 320 watts down to 150 watts is a much bigger step down. While the rumored core configuration for the RTX 3080 Mobile has it using a full GA104 die with 6,144 CUDA cores higher than the desktop RTX 3070 with its 5,888 CUDA cores, Ultimately, I'd expect similar performance from the two parts. That would still be quite impressive to get essentially a 2080 Ti in a laptop form factor, but of course, we'll have to wait and see when it is actually unveiled. This should have a flow-on effect to other mobile GPUs like the RTX 3070, which should be closer to an RTX 3060 Ti and so on. While it seems very likely we'll be getting new gaming laptops at CES this year, what remains unclear is whether Nvidia will also talk about new desktop GPUs or leave that for a separate announcement. We've heard that the RTX 3080 Ti with 20 gigabytes of memory is imminent, although that shouldn't surprise many as there have been many leaks for this product over the last few months directly from manufacturers. We're also expecting an RTX 3060 soon and possibly the RTX 3050 as well, although again, we really have no idea what the plans are for Nvidia's CES event and whether they'll just stick to mobile GPUs or also announce these parts. Of course, we won't be getting new gaming laptops without refreshed gaming capable CPUs and we're expecting that as well this CES, as a bunch of rumors would suggest. AMD are allegedly going to reveal their Ryzen 5000 lineup for laptops, covering both the U-series for 15W Ultra Portables and the H-series for 45W gaming laptops and productivity workstations. There have been a wealth of leaks and rumors suggesting a split lineup, with some parts being Zen 2 based and the others being Zen 3 based. For example, the Ryzen 7 5700U would be an 8-core Zen 2 processor, so basically the old 
Ryzen 7 4800U, while the Ryzen 7 5800U would be an 8-core Zen 3 processor. The key parts here really will be those Zen 3 CPUs, with some rumours suggesting both higher clock speeds and IPC gains to deliver 25% better single-thread performance, although you should always take these early rumours with a grain of salt. The expectation is that AMD and Nvidia will launch their new components at roughly the same time, so new laptops will be made with a combination of new AMD CPUs and new Nvidia GPUs. We also might see some new AMD Radeon RX 6000 series mobile GPUs thrown into the mix as well, though there is less information right now on what that might look like. While these parts are expected to be announced at CES, I have heard from a few OEMs that actual availability for Ryzen 5000 won't be until a few weeks later or possibly in February. Intel aren't being left out of this conversation either, they too have a CES event planned, and the expectation here again is that it will be mostly focused on mobile processors. As Intel already launched their Tiger Lake CPUs for ultra-portable laptops late last year, all eyes are on the H series and what Intel will be doing in the gaming laptop and workstation market. I was originally expecting to hear about Tiger Lake 8 core designs at this event, but I believe those parts won't launch until a few months later, so instead the focus will be on a new H35 series, which will end up as 35 watt 4 core designs, essentially slightly higher clocked variants of the existing 28 watt UP3 series parts. Later on, we'll get the 45 watt parts at up to 8 cores, although that could be a couple of months from now. These quad cores though should be capable processors and competitive in single thread performance which will create an interesting battle between AMD's new Zen 3 mobile CPUs and Intel for gaming. However, AMD launching 8 core designs right off the bat will probably create a performance disparity in the market until Intel gets those 8 core Tiger Lake designs into production. This is why many gaming laptop leaks have been centered more around AMD designs which are finally set to feature high end Nvidia GPUs than Intel at this stage. With that said, the expectation is that Intel's H35 series will be available around roughly the same time as AMD's Ryzen 5000 series and new RTX 30 GPUs from Nvidia. Outside of that, MSI has supposedly confirmed that Intel's Rocket Lake processors won't be coming until the end of March, so it's unlikely we'll hear too much about that at CES, outside of maybe a few teasers here and there. Rocket Lake is set to be compatible with both 400 and 500 series Intel motherboards, so board partners like MSI are already preparing BIOS updates for their existing lineups to support the new CPUs. In fact, some Z490 boards have already received 11th gen Intel support updates. Before then, we should be learning more about new 500 series chipsets and motherboards in preparation for new Rocket Lake CPUs down the track. This should be part of Intel's CES launches in addition to their mobile news, not 100% sure on that, but pretty sure. Uh, the big feature for 500 series chipsets like Z590 will be PCIe 4.0 support, although again, it's unclear whether this will be unique to Z590 or also available on Z490 as many motherboard manufacturers advertised PCIe 4.0 support on Z490 back when they launched last year. Anyway, lots of launches upcoming. I guess this video has been mostly a look at what the market is doing right now and what we can expect within the next week or so at CES. Not a great time for building a desktop PC, but maybe within a month it won't be too bad for buying a gaming laptop if these rumors are anything to go by. Anyway, that's it for this News Corner episode. If you're interested in subscribing to the channel, you can do that. Links are, of course, below. We also have in the description below all of our Patreon and Floatplane accounts. If you're interested in signing up and supporting the channel directly, we do appreciate all the support we get through there. That's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.